joining us. I am Clay T. White. We're hosting the We Need to Talk series to foster open dialogue and begin formulating solutions to address systemic racism and white supremacy. These much needed discussions were the brainchild of Dr. Su Kim Chung, head of public services in UNLV's special collections and archives and are sponsored by University Libraries and the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs. These panel discussions will provide historical context dating back to 1619 while addressing issues that are challenging us in the present day. Each conversation brings together UNLV researchers and community experts. We will formulate solutions to long-term work we must do to heal our country and move us forward. This will take a commitment from all of us. These conversations will be difficult, but we must do this work. Truly, we need to talk. Tonight, we are talking about defining concepts like white privilege, systemic racism, institutional racism, and those kinds of concepts. My guests tonight are Dr. A.B. Wilkinson, Brenda Williams, and Kevin Wright. So first, let me tell you a little about each of these people before we get started. A.B. Wilkinson is an assistant professor here in the history department at UNLV. He teaches classes in colonial North America, the U.S. Revolutionary Era, and early U.S. history. He also has research and teaching interest in African American history, Native American history, ethnic studies, and, US, and the U.S. South. He has a Ph.D. from the University of California, Berkeley, and his new book that is hot off the press I think it has been released right now, it's being released right now. It is called Blurring the Lines of Race and Freedom, Mulattoes and Mixed Bloods in English Colonial America. Kevin Wright currently serves as the Interim Assistant Director of Student Diversity in the Office of Student Diversity and Social Justice. Now that is old information. Kevin just got a promotion, and because I am so, uh, I'm so behind on the times, I don't even know what his new title is, but he is creating positive institutional and systemic changes uh, with the students here on UNLV's campus. Kevin is currently pursuing a doctorate of education in organizational leadership at North Central University. And I've saved last the last person, Brenda Williams, for last for a reason. Brenda is a person from our community right here, and I know her very, very well. She grew up in Las Vegas. Her family originally came from Fordyce, Arkansas. Brenda is the first black woman to serve as an interim city council person for the city of Las Vegas, Ward 5. She has served on the city's planning commission. She was the co-coordinator for the campaign of Senator Richard Bryan. And after his election, so she was very successful because after his election, she served with him for 12 years as his constituent services representative. Her other positions were in the field of banking, Department of Motor Vehicles, she is the founder and president of the West Side School Alumni Foundation, where they wrote a book 
Linda, uh, Brenda authored West Side School Stories, Our School, Our Community, Our Time, 1923 to 1967. But of all of her accomplishments, the one I love best is that at one time she owned a hat shop. Can you imagine? Okay, so we have an entrepreneur, we have educators, and we are now going to begin to talk about the topic of the evening. It was only until a few months ago that we actually started talking about terms like systemic racism. The average person had not heard that term, so that's why we wanted this, this series. I was a bit surprised though when a lot of people my academic friends on this campus and a lot of others had no idea what systemic racism, institutional racism, what those terms really meant. So we need to talk. And tonight we are going to start by, by this first question. I want to sort of complicate this a little bit. Talking about racism, we want to talk about white supremacy first. And I want to Brenda, I want you to use a few life examples. I want to talk about whether or not this term white supremacy has become something to kind of be proud of. And that's I'm saying it like that because if you think about what happened in Central Park. So if we can start there. Brenda, could you start us off and then A.B., you can jump in at any point. Uh, well, actually, uh, when we start talking about uh, white privilege is basically what we're speaking of. Uh, I believe the lady, they called her uh, Central Park Karen. Uh, she sought to uh, make it bad for a black man who's walking his dog, a bird watching, and claimed that he was attempting to assault her all the time. He was actually recording her. So what happened that turned, what turned out is that what she intended for his bad turned out to be her bad. And she was arrested and, and criminal charges were against her. So I would have to say that uh, Karen, and that is not her name, but uh, in fact, she embarrassed herself she embarrassed her gender, and she embarrassed the white people. So no doubt that was certainly not something that was advantageous to her. So, so if you could continue that, A.B., and sort of give us an, an example of one of the common definitions of white, of white privilege and, and go ahead with that example. Yeah, uh, white privilege is uh, people of European descent um, who are racially labeled as white and sometimes I'll throw up these air quotes around white or, or black and um, maybe if I'm using historical terms uh, just because uh, they're racial terms and, and I like not to use racial terms. I like to address people by their ethnicity or who they are as a person or an individual. But, um, you know, whiteness comes with something in this country historically uh, that gives uh, people an advantage in ways over those uh, who are labeled people of color, African Americans, Native Americans, uh, Latinos, and so on and so forth. Um, and so this comes out of a, a real historical process. And, and just speaking a little bit personally, I mean, I'm of African, Native American, and European descent. Um, uh, my book is a lot like me search or research, you know, uh, it is on my family. but. Um, there is light skin privilege as well, and I think that that you know goes along in African American communities, other communities as well. Um, we're aware of it, you know, within the African American community, uh, but I don't think many people of European descent are always as aware, aware of the privileges that they have just with light or quote unquote white skin. Um, and just a, a, a short, quick aside. I remember just a few years ago, I was trying to publish uh, just a little article. Um, I'll, le I'll leave the um, kind of uh, the name uh, of, of this press uh, out, but uh, they didn't want to accept my article because I used the word white supremacy in it. Um, and it was very hard for me to use that term just a few years ago, um, in fact. Uh, editors wanted me to take that term out. 
um, you know, was seen as, ah, we don't really want to publish that. It is an online news article, but, um, you know, people have been very afraid of that word for, for a long time. So hopefully we can get into some of that discussion. Go, yes, please. You know, I, I think that white supremacy is being somewhat debunked as considering the times that we're in today because um, the pandemic has made a big difference in the perception of who's in power and who's not. Uh, black people uh, and people of color are no longer the ones who are unemployed or homeless. Uh, hunger and homelessness uh, have no color. Uh, illness has no color. The only difference that is it, 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 that comes through uh, all of us in being human beings is the color of the skin. The rest of us, we, we were made in the image of God, so we're all human beings who we'll all have a heart and all of those, we know that story. But what about the essential workers though? Uh, during the pandemic, we find that the people on the front lines doing that essential work were mostly people of color. So how do you put that into that equation? Does white privilege allow you then not to have those kinds of jobs? Uh, actually, uh, white privilege does preclude uh, them from having that type of job because uh, once the pe uh, minorities are, are actually fired, first hired, you know, that, that type, last, last hired, uh, f first fired, then the white person is going to get that job. So that puts uh, the black person or the minority in a deficit position, which they normally are in anyway. Uh, and, and so the, the, the power has been usurped uh, by the majority and, and the minority is then again on the bottom. Okay, so and those are the jobs we see as the yes. essential jobs today. Yes. Uh, I wanna talk about systemic racism. Mm -hmm. Time is passing so fast that I, I'm gonna skip ahead because we could just talk about white supremacy the entire time. But systemic racism, and you can refer to this if you want to as institutional racism, uh, structural racism, we hear all those terms now. Talk about what that means to somebody who only a few months ago had no idea what systemic racism is, was, is. So you can talk about it with healthcare, education, redlining, any way you want to explain it. A.B., can we start with you this time? Yeah, if we're talking about systems of oppression, uh, people typically think about slavery, right? Um, and that's, that's where I teach a lot on. I teach in the early colonial period and into the early United States. Um, but I like to remind students um, that this is not, you know, that plantations, the plantation economy, uh, the economy that fed, uh, you know, tobacco, rice, sugar, and cotton plantations um, many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago. Uh, that was one system of racial oppression. Uh, after slavery, we have Jim Crow and segregation. Um, that's another system of racial oppression. And these are structures, um, whether it be labor structures, uh, whether it be um, housing and segregation under Jim Crow oppression. We can look at uh, the prison uh, and, and the penal system. Uh, so I'm talking about everything from policing to the courts uh, to the jails who we know uh, are full of, uh, you know, low income. So I think that what Brenda brings up is that there, there are poor Euro-American people, poor white people, right? Um, but we know that African Americans and Latinos are disproportionately represented in these systems, right? Um, we could talk about uh, schooling and education. Um, uh, these are large institutions um, that really uh, have, a, have a, an effect on everyone's lives, right? And so when we're thinking about 
you know, white supremacy maybe is someone using a racial slur, the mm -hmm. N-word. Okay, that's on the individual level. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the numbers and who's underrepresented or overrepresented in these institutions, um, you know, we have to consider what's going on with policing today, mm -hmm. what's going on in the educational system, um, who it, it's more difficult for to get a home loan. Mm -hmm. um, these things are still things that African Americans, um, Latinos, and other people of color are still facing um, outside of just class. That's correct. So, Brenda? What he just said about home loans. Uh, back in the day, I was the first African American ever to work in a bank in the state of Nevada in a non-service position. I went to work there as a teller. And I was told, I, I really wasn't looking for a job, uh, but I saw, uh, they called it personnel back then, and I saw the sign on the wall and I thought, well, let me go and apply for a job. So I'll go in, find out, uh, yeah, they had openings if I could pass their test. And I said, well, when, you, when did I get the test? And they said, can you take it now? And I said, sure, you don't need to study now. Just give me the test. I don't know what you do. But anyway, long story short, that was quite an experience. And people today who are in banking, they really don't understand what I went through there. My first day at work, my boss told me, you know, we have to work with you, but we don't have to like it, and we don't have to like you. I had people get in a line that was twice as long as the line at my window because they didn't want a black person, and it, that was being nice. I'm being nice with that word, uh, handling their money. How ridiculous is that? But yet, once they saw that my line moved faster mm -hmm. than the others, they came over, you know, to the other side. You talk about home ownership. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, black people saved their money, and they always did. Uh, they could not obtain a home loan, but the banker would give, uh, lend them money to buy a Cadillac car. That's right. That was the way it was. Mm -hmm we can move forward now and start talking about home ownership on the basis of uh, appraisal redlining. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in my community where I live, I live on three quarters of an acre. She lives in but the you have village. But you have to, when you do appraisals, and I was an appraiser, uh, you have to do, uh, in order to arrive at a value, you do comps or comparables. But when you're in my area, your comps have to be within three, three miles of your property. So now I'm on three quarters of an acre, but six miles out, seven miles out, there are no three quarter acre properties. So my property is being valued the same as the guy that has the 50 by 100 foot lot. That's discrimination. Redlining, is no longer, it was outlawed in 1968, I believe. It was outlawed. And, uh, outlawed. It, it, it's, it's just taken a different form. Right. If you order something online or you want to apply for something online, the first thing that pops up is where is your, you know, what is your zip code? Yep. Now your zip code, you know, 89106 and 89030 are uh, primarily, uh, used to be African American. So right away you're stigmatized. You're gonna get a loan perhaps if you have the right credit rating, but you're gonna get a higher interest rate uh, loan. And I can discontinue talking well, until well, you take a break. Yes, but uh, what you said is very true. It was outlawed in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act, but we find that it's still happening. We saw a news report the other day on CBS that showed houses in Chicago that are still being redlined against. against. So that is still happening. So when we look at that banking structure. So thank you for, for that example. I, I wanna move on to talk about something that happened the other day. This really doesn't have anything to do with, this is sort of a reversal of white supremacy. So can wealthy blacks be a part of systemic racism? Can they? 
get into the conversation. Like we're having a conversation now, would a wealthy black person be able to sit here and talk about these things? The reason I'm asking is because the Clippers coach the other day, Doc Rivers said, and I quote, my father was a 30 year veteran of the Chicago Police Department. And if he was still with us right now, he'd be hurt and outraged by the senseless acts of racial injustice that continue to plague our country. Being black in America is tough. I personally have been called more racial, racial slurs than I can count, been pulled over more times than I can count, even had my house burned down. He earns $10 million a year. And because of that income, the discussion flipped immediately to the amount of money he earns. So does he have a right to say those kinds of things with the kind of money he's making? Yes. Yes, I, 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 I think he does because he has a responsibility in my mind to look back from whence he came. He did not come from old money, wealthy parents. So yes, he came from somewhere uh, along with the rest of us, whether it's down south where they picked cotton or up in uh, the industrial areas where you built cars. Uh, so I think the fact that money talks and the trickle down effect, if I pull my money out, I'm making 10 million and I pull my money out, then somebody's gonna have a negative effect somewhere down the line. So I need to be a part of that conversation because if I'm a part of that conversation, then perhaps I can make changes come about. It, it, it's kind of like the, the football and basketball players. Uh, yes. Once they stopped getting paid, a lot of people were affected there. The fans were affected. The owners were affected. Everything trickled all the way down to the guy that sells popcorn. Exactly. Sorry, AP. You're good. I just talk a lot. And, and I, you know, this is where I think we can have discussions within the African American community about that, but that's not where those responses come from. And I think this points exactly to how white supremacy works. Exactly. Um, you know, and it's not just, maybe going back a little bit, white supremacists are not just the ones, uh, you know, burning the crosses or carrying the tiki torches. Mm -hmm. we're th when we're talking about white supremacy yes. within these kind of systems or institutions, they're baked into the cake. And this is what we're talking about, right? It takes us generations to accumulate wealth, to move yes. up. Um, and I think these are some of the things that Brenda is talking about as well. And so, uh, you know, if I, I get these with, with student papers sometimes too, the students will say, well, I don't know if there's racism. And I try, and I try to create a classroom where everyone is allowed to speak. Um, you know, I want them to speak their minds and, and I'm not judging any student by, you know, whether they're on the left or on the right, Democrat, Republican, um, independent, does not matter to me. So mm -hmm. I, I've, I've created kind of a, an environment where they're able to say some things, but some students will just say, hey, you've got these basketball players making millions. How are African Americans still complaining about inequality? Obama was in the White House. Um, but let's look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. Let's look at, uh, you know, how many people are making that type of money in the averages overall, and, and they're just not there. And uh, just because someone has money does not mean that they can't speak on some issues. Otherwise, the guy in the White House wouldn't be allowed to say nothing, right? I mean, <laughs> let's be real here. Okay. So if you understand the issues, you should be allowed to speak on the issues. I agree. You know, this has been such a rich conversation and, and, and Kevin couldn't join us here in the studio today. So Kevin is remote and he is, I'm looking at him because he's on a monitor in front of me and he is just chomping at the bit. So I'm gonna go to, to Kevin now to let him come into this conversation. And unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to join in. So it's just gonna be me and Kevin just for a few minutes. So Kevin, how are you doing over there? Over there. I'm doing good, Clay T, how are you doing? So Kevin, I just want, I just want you to jump in and talk just a bit about white supremacy also. You heard how the conversation started a bit ago. So could you uh, jump in on that with your ideas? 
Yeah, I, I know that some people provided some historical context, and I really appreciate that. And sometimes it's it's um, disheartening to know that sometimes people don't understand how deep this truly goes, like even into the systems that we have to navigate. And I'll speak from my lens just because I don't want to speak for anybody else's uh, craft or praxis or work, right? So I work in higher education. A lot of times people don't even know the history of higher education, the history of colleges, right? Colleges were not initially designed to advance people of color, nor women. And even when they did let women into to colleges, they were told, they were taught how to be wives, right? And even then, what kind of women? White women, right? Um, or the fact that colleges and universities are built on stolen land of indigenous tribal communities, right? Like that is how far this goes. That, that's how deep this truly goes, where even when we're trying to navigate systems that have been reframed to advance people on an equal or equitable standpoint, we're still subscribing to systems of white supremacy. Right. Everything from the curriculum design, the standards of engagement, the hard sell of a higher education, meaning that if you spend four to six years to get this piece of paper, you will advance in society and be accepted amongst, you know, the elite, quote unquote, the, the system of hierarchy, the lack of representation of tenured faculty of color. Right. Uh, and even not even just by race, but also by gender. Right. And then how some institutions offer ethnic studies or Africana studies or Latinx studies as a minor, as opposed to primary curriculum. And it's one of those things where many institutions only do it either because they, quote unquote, can't find an educator or they're just trying to checklist diversity. Right. And then they then put that into their mission statement and say, like, oh, we have a strong commitment to diversity. We have an Africana studies minor. It's just like, that's cute. Right. So it's one of those things where sometimes we get blindsided by the veil of white supremacy. Right. And in terms of systemic racism, I definitely have seen that in practice. And but then also in research because of the fact that from from my experiences uh, working in my current position to give context, I now serve as the assistant director for student diversity. Um, but in my former position as the black African American program coordinator in the office of student diversity and social justice, one of the things that was brought up many times by students within the African diaspora that I engaged with were two big topics, financial literacy and mental health. So when you talk about systemic racism, when it comes to mental health, there is a large disparity amongst folks within just specifically the African diaspora, but even more so people who hold historically marginalized identities that tend to um, engage in situations that lead to a misdiagnosis or an adequate treatment when trying to address mental health concerns, only because of the fact that many mental health practitioners lack cultural competency and possess cultural and unconscious and also explicit bias, some of which are rooted in systems of whiteness, some of which are connected to systems of white supremacy. So therefore, because of the fact that you are other, we are going to treat you as such, and even then not truly address and accommodate your needs. Even in light of the fact that you took the step and have the bravery to try to address the fact that like, hey, I'm not okay. I need to talk to somebody, right? So even trying to navigate systems that can help us tend to our needs, our physiological needs, sometimes are a detriment because of how they are initially designed, right? So when you even look at mental health practitioners in terms of the general makeup of who's working in these fields, who's giving treatment, who's giving misdiagnosis, who is lacking that cultural competency, what are the systems in place for the training to engage and improve and further enhance that competency? Right, because at the end of the day, mental health should not be a cookie, a cookie cutter practice. And yet, many systems rooted in whiteness and white supremacy stem from doing just that, putting things into practice where it's just like, oh, we're going to treat everyone the exact same way. And it's like, that is not what we should be doing. You know, we need to have an equity uh, centered lens and we need to have uh, an approach that's rooted in the intersectionality of the different identities that we possess. And then furthermore, when it comes to financial literacy, when you think about the lack of accessible language, the lack of transparency in regards to how financial processes are executed, it is mind boggling. And, I'm, and I've heard this from so many students that I've worked with within the African diaspora where they were told by their family, hey, I don't, we, don't, we don't do banks. We don't trust banks. And I always ask myself, like, where do you think that comes from? And they're just like, I don't know, but like my mom told me that we don't trust banks just because my grandmother told her that we don't trust banks. And it's just like, OK, look at the historical significance of banking institutions. Banking institutions used to accept people who were enslaved as collateral in order for slave owners to get loans to own land that was stolen from indigenous communities. And it's just like, whoa, that is, that's how deep this goes. 
right? So when people are saying like, oh, we don't trust banks, we don't do banks, we don't do this. It's just like, you may not know the context because sometimes people don't, don't even know the story where it's like, yeah, it's very common for people of color to not trust banks, especially those within the African diaspora. Because when you look at the, his, the history of how banking institutions were formed, they were they built their, their wealth and they built their sustainability and they maintained their business practices because of the fact that they accepted human bodies, enslaved bodies as collateral. So other people who benefit from white supremacy could own land that was stolen. So therefore, it's one of those things where that is the, the, the premise that I always try to get folks to understand. That is the, that is, um, that's the purpose of why I, I do what I do, because I want people to know that like we need to understand how far this truly goes, because it's interconnected and deeply rooted in all of our intersectional um, histories and how that even influences us to how we operate and navigate today. And I like the way you put that. We, we need that kind of analysis. So thank you so much for that. Can you speak to the idea of wealthy Blacks not being a part of the conversation or shouldn't be a part of the conversation? Yeah, so when it comes to folks within the African diaspora that, you know, do stem from wealth, I have no issue personally of them being a part of the conversation. I think they need to be a part of the conversation to an extent. And I say that because of the fact that I now am asking, okay, you have all this wealth. So therefore, you now have all this access. What are you doing with it? Are you only benefiting yourself or are you benefiting other communities, right? There have been times where I've seen celebrities be asked questions about like, oh, what are your thoughts on things that happened with George Floyd? Or what are your thoughts on Black Lives Matter? Or what are your thoughts on, you know, this thing that impacts people that look like you? And then those celebrities will stay quiet and then they'll get on their Twitter pages and, and start complaining about like, oh my God, why is there so much, you know, nonsense happening in the world? It's just like, okay, you sitting on $10 million. What are you doing to address it? You know, like you have access to people that have power. You have conversations with people that could probably change systems. You have money that could be invested into communities that you know are not thriving, right? So my thing is like, yes, be a part of the conversation, but furthermore, be a part of the action that comes from those conversations. And furthermore, be a part of the action that leads to the solution of the problem that you are complaining about or want to quote unquote, have a conversation about. Because again, many people that look like me, we are done talking, right? We need a, a immediate action. And if not immediate action, a plan to get to said action. Again, that's why I tell people if, you know, with wealthy individuals, yeah, sit on that wealth and, and spread that wealth. Be so strategic Kevin, with that wealth. So Kevin, so Kevin the, other day, the other day they asked Okay, so uh, two police officers were shot in Compton. And because LeBron James has spoken out very fervently about police violence and police brutality over the last months or so, they went to him personally and asked him to help pay for the, uh, what do you call it when you put up money so that people will come forward to tell the truth. They ask him personally to match the fund. So what do you think about that? Because they, they think a black person shot those police officers. So if we're going to paint this narrative that we need to you know, follow the laws and you're innocent until proven guilty and give people just due trial and all that jazz, unless there is evidence that says that a black person shot those cops, then we shouldn't be operating off of the assumption that a black person shot those cops and we shouldn't be placing the burden on black people to try to address this matter. Granted, there is a large narrative and a large discourse between the relationship between communities of color and those in law enforcement. And at the end of the day, that's that's the issue. There's a, there's a big disconnect between both of these these communities because of the fact that one, there's a lot of systemic issues that people are not acknowledging. When you think about the historical significance of how law enforcement was even created, it was created so they could put people, men, particularly white men, particularly in power in order to essentially go and track down runaway enslaved people. That's how it was created, right? So it's one of those things where like, we're not even taking the time to acknowledge that. And yet through the different eras of history we've just been building on that intergenerational trauma where cops are are not 
you know, perceived positively because of the issues that come from their training, their, um, their reaction behaviors, and then also their profiling of black and brown bodies or in other folks that hold historically marginalized identities. So them going to LeBron, I don't have the, the most um, intricate opinion about that only because of the fact that I'm hoping that LeBron James is using his clout and his privilege in order to address and work together in order to figure out, okay, so how do we move forward knowing that there is a big disconnect between communities of color and law enforcement? He has done quite a bit. So before I leave you, I'm going to have you approach the last question that I'm gonna ask the panel. So is it our job, is it the job of black people to talk to our friends and colleagues and church members about systemic racism. Is it up to us to teach them about this? So I definitely do not believe it is our job because when I hear job, I think of employment and I definitely have educated a few people and was not paid for it. And then on top of that, I definitely was not paid for the emotional labor that I put into that conversation. So my approach is that I'll give you a little free sample and just be like, hey, you know, don't do that because one, that's racist, two, that's problematic, three, that's rooted in white supremacy. So, you know, check yourself, check your privilege and then go educate yourself, right? So it's like, I'll call you out the first time, but I'm not here to repeat myself and I'm not here to be black Wikipedia or black Google, quite frankly, which is why I always tell people like, hey, that was not right. Hey, that is actually low key racist, if not high key racist, right? And then I provide uh, resources to folks and say like, hey, you should go read this book. Or as a matter of fact, take some time to read this article and let me know what you think about it. Because at the end of the day, I am around many people that are of good sound in mind, that know how to read a book, that know how to do a Google search, that know how to use technology to their advantage. So that's why I always try to hold people accountable. So my thing is like, I don't think it's our job to educate folks. However, I think that it is everyone's responsibility to hold each other accountable. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that black people should just should be holding everyone accountable. I'm saying that like black people, brown folks, uh, white folks, you know, non-black folks all together should be interconnectedly holding each other collectively accountable in order to be better and to decolonize their mindset because of the fact that they are navigating with a, a colonized mindset because of the fact that there are systems that are in place that have not been decolonized, that have not been reframed and have not been restructured in order to actually advance people equitably because of the fact that these equality cookie cutter systems are not working. So therefore, no, it's not our job. However, it's one of those things where we shouldn't hesitate to have the conversations and people that we engage with should not hesitate to do the self work. Go read a book, go read an article. I, if you don't know where to start, it's called Google. You know how to use it. If you still don't know where to start, okay, go read this book and then you figure out the rest. But it's one of those things where I'm not here to you know, do any handholding. And I come from a background where my family told me that life is not a bakery, so therefore you, sugar, you shouldn't be sugarcoating anything, right? And that's why I tell people, we need to address you know, the white supremacist elephant in the room, not tiptoe around like, oh, I think there's a race issue. It's just like, no, it's white supremacy. Like we need to be more explicit and honest about what exactly are we navigating in society and, how, and what are we doing individually, but then also collectively to address it. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. I, I'm so sorry that you couldn't be here in the studio with us, but so happy to have your, your input into these questions. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so back to here in the studio. The, the one question that uh, I approached with uh, Kevin that I didn't approach with you. So is it our job to train our colleagues, our white colleagues, our white friends, church members about systemic racism? I don't believe so. How are they gonna, I, how are they gonna learn? Well, they, I, I think they should um, seek for themselves. They should want to know. They should want to know, have a better, a better life, a better life for their children, a better life for, um, human beings in general. I, I have uh, one of my experiences after people meet me and they says, you know, you're not like the rest of them. What? The rest of who? Okay. And I said, uh, how many black people do you know? They don't know any black people. 
So their perception is what they've seen on the media, what they've heard from their parents or from their grandparents. So it's, it's, it's difficult for me to address. I said, so then what you need to do actually is that, that you accept me as I am because I'm unapologetically black. I don't make any bones. I don't try to speak nasally. I don't try to do any of those. I am who I am. And that tells me that you have to be who you are and you need to go and search out other black people so that you will get to know that they're not these people that you actually think are so horrible. And, and again, I, I think the media has a lot to do with that. And I'm going to address this very quickly. Um, if you read in the paper, just look at the paper tomorrow. If there's an African-American who has committed a crime, mm -hmm. you'll see their picture on, on, in, on the newspaper. If it was a white person, they say a man did thus and so. They don't put his picture up, even though you know it, and they don't say a black man, so you know that it was not a black person that did the crime. That's racism, okay? That, that, that is one of the things that I read the paper daily, have done it all of my life, and I see it, and it's still just, just a punch in the gut when you see it. We don't commit all of the crimes. We're not in the majority, so that makes no sense that anyone would think that. Exactly. A.V.? Do you? Is it our job? Is yes, it our job? Our well, job. I get paid to teach, so <laughs> it is technically my job. But um, we, we don't do the best job because they're not listening to us, you know, okay. as people of color. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, there are some people out there, there, there are allies, right? Mm -hmm. There are people um, that, that are not people of color, that they don't identify as people of color. Um, Euro-Americans, whites, right, um, who are coming out to the protests now, right? They're, they're supporting us in, in, in these civil rights movements that are continuing, right? Because this is a continuation of the civil rights movement. Uh, exactly. It didn't stop, you exactly. know? Um, and so that's, that's why we're, we're getting a lot more media attention now these days, so on and so forth, the cameras, right? We already knew these things were taking place in our communities. Um, we don't have to teach, you know, as people of color, we don't have to teach each other about systematic racism. We live it every day. We've seen our parents, our grandparents um, have heard the stories, have lived uh, through these things that we're talking about here. Um, and, and so it, it really gains the most traction when I see it with my students of, of European descent, when they go home over Thanksgiving dinner, and they have those tough conversations. That's why I like the title of this, We Need to Talk, <laughs> right? Uh, we've always been talking about these things. It's time for Euro-America to, to further these conversations within their communities, join us in our communities, right? Um, so it, it's, that's where we're gonna get the most movement. Right. And, and as other people have said, they've gotta want to learn. So one of the things that, um, a feature on the program that I didn't share with you is that we have questions coming in. So we're going to switch now and we're going to talk about some of the questions that are being sent in. So the first one is, and this, I'll wait and I'll save that one for last because it's really our last question. Why, why do you think is so uncomfortable for people to discuss these issues? racism, white supremacy. Why is that so difficult? I think it's probably the fear of unknown. Most of it is fear. They don't know and they're afraid to venture out to find out. They have to recognize inequality really, right? Mm -hmm. if, if a lot of people are in denial about mm -hmm. white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? Well, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, burning the torch, right? I'm not going out to lynch anyone. Um, but, but now you have these uh, conversations that are coming up. Well, if you don't say something, you're complicit, right? And, and, and I love this, right? Because it challenges us all to have these difficult conversations. Um, you know, sometimes it's the loudest person in the room mm -hmm. 
and, and so we stay quiet when there's a comment made, right? Um, you know, and I challenge uh, everyone, um, and sometimes it's tough for myself to, to, because I hear things because I'm very light-skinned. People perceive mm -hmm. me as white, mm -hmm. and so I hear a lot of things that, that I think if I were a few shades darker, uh, mm -hmm. I would not hear. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's even hard for me to step up and, and challenge um, you know, others sometimes and, and say, well, you know, why don't, why don't you think about that? You know, are, are African Americans really just getting shot unarmed by the police for, for no reason? Like, mm -hmm. we, see, we have the statistics two to three times. Um, you know, African American men are shot and killed by police mm -hmm. in this country. Why is this a discussion, right, of if police brutality is a thing? Um, you know, we need to come to solutions. How do we address it? Not all police are bad, right? It, it is just some, but let's let's get to the root of how we can solve these issues so the next question is what are some recommended resources for people who want to learn more about issues like what we've discussed today so earlier someone has already said google uh, what, what what else did, would you is there a book that you read recently that is an easy book that is has it explained all of these terms? <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, you, you know, here's where, here's where the author says, well, if you read my book, you know, and I'm not going to say that, I'm not going to say that. But, um, you know, it's, you can read books. The books are out there, yes. right? Yes. Talk to people. You know, watch these programs. You know, you're doing it right now if you're watching this mm -hmm. at home, right? Mm -hmm. Also, want everyone to know that when you go to the website where you found this program, there we put together a list of resources that all you have to do is click on them and start reading because we've listed all of them for you. Mm -hmm. So we've made it easy. Clayty, how, how do you reach then the people who don't read well, who don't comprehend? I, I listen to most talk shows. And I find that the people who are discussing the issues are basically talking to themselves or someone on their level. Mm -hmm. They're using terms and, and words that, you know, people don't understand. So they understand there's an issue, but I'm not sure how that affects me. Okay. So how? So, so, I, so you switched it and you were asking I, I'm me I'm sorry asking now. you that question. So, but, uh, but I think that we said earlier that we have to have allies. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're in a, a room after Thanksgiving dinner, after a football game, doing a football game, whenever you're congregated, someone is going to have to have the integrity to stand up. Mm -hmm. Somebody's just going to have to do it and say, this conversation is not healthy. Mm -hmm. Probably by saying enough is enough. Yes. Like you said, we need to talk. Let's yes, talk about this. Exactly. So let me show you to uh, take you to this last question. One of the things that we want out of this series is that we actually want solutions. And we've asked you to think about how we can go from here. What, what, what is it for us to do? For us to go from here. Uh, someone has asked, how can we do better in Las Vegas? So, so what is that? How, how can we do it? How can we be better? You going? <laughs> <laughs> I can, we, we can go back and forth. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Can please just, yeah. just have a conversation. So, yeah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, education, of course, right? Exactly. Um, but, it, you know, and it starts at K through 12, kindergarten through, through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. um, I, so many of my students come to me and they've learned so much misinformation mm -hmm, um, yes. that, that half of the time I'm really unteaching the bad information, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but, but again, we have, you know, we talk about the internet, we have this information at our fingertips. Um, we can learn, but, but get involved, you know, that's, that's where I would say go find an organization, go find a group. It's, it's tough right now because of COVID. Yes. Um, but I mean, if, if you don't believe these things are, are happening right now, I mean, COVID is another a, a prime example of systematic uh, oppression, racism. Right. Who, who's dying, right? Mm 
uh, African Americans, Latinos, were suffering in the, in the largest numbers um, from the virus. Native Americans, um, you know, on the reservations uh, contracting the virus. And, and because of the lack of health care, as Kevin pointed out, in some areas, w we're being affected. Um, get involved, you know, get involved. Um, and this is where I could uh, hand it to yes. the people in the community who have been activists for years. Yes. I, I agree with you, it's education, and you said K through 12, and I agree with that, but I really think it starts at preschool, because we're talking about the baseline. These kids are easily influenced, and they love each other. They don't know that prejudice until someone teaches it to them. So it also starts with the teachers. Uh, some teachers are uncomfortable teaching black kids because they don't know them. They have no history, no diversity. Uh, they might get a, a few weeks of diversity training once they get hired by CCSD, but that still does not give them uh, a true understanding. But once the children, the small children learn, they're gonna take it home to their parents mm -hmm. and it's going to work like that. And I think that's the way we will grow it from there, but where do we go from now, where we are right now is probably uh, the question. I, I think uh, I heard this lady say to her kids, uh, no, we're not going over there. I guess it was her, her kid's friend. And I knew instinctively that they were talking about the West Side, mm. where the predominantly black people live. Over there, that is a common terminology that tells you there's discrimination in the air. I was listening to Clark County School District board meeting the other day and one of the board members said, I have friends over there. And I'm going, oh my God, mm -hmm. over there, why can't you just say over on the west side? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's those types of things. The kids need to be taught our history to know what black people brought to the table. You know, it's not this, the cotton gin and all of that stuff. Talk about the fact that they were doctors and they were lawyers back in the day and they were bankers and insurance people and all of those things that make up America today but it has been squashed by those who tend to want to be superior to us. So I, I agree. I think American history has to be taught in a different yes. way. I didn't learn American history. At, at Las Vegas High School, we were taught American history. I don't believe one black person was in the book. Wow. Okay, that, yes, that, that, that's so that has to right. change. But the reason I don't say African-American history anymore when I'm talking in community groups mm. is because when they invite me to give a, pre a, a presentation on African-American history, mm -hmm. the white people in the room already go to their computers mm. or start writing. Mm -hmm. So I say I'm gonna talk about American history. Uh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's the way I do it yes. today. Yeah, and, and adding on to that, uh -huh. uh, you know, U.S. history is African American history, mm -hmm. is Native American history. Yes. You know, when I, I told my students the other day, uh, the largest immigration uh, was forced immigration uh, from 1492 to the 1820s. There were more Africans mm -hmm. who came across the Atlantic than there were Europeans until the 1820s. Mm -hmm. Native Americans were the majority of the population of North America uh, until around the founding of the United States. Um, so these are things that we're, we're not talking about just ethnic studies. We're talking about, yeah, ethnic studies is U.S. studies. So yeah, definitely agree. Yes. Very, very, that's awesome. This has been wonderful. It is. I, I just, We're just we getting could go warmed on up. and on, but of course, we have, we're almost at the end. So we're, I'm just going to ask for closing remarks. Uh, I, I don't know if I can bring Kevin back in for any closing remarks, but I don't think so. I'm going to wait to get the eye. So could I get closing remarks from the two of you? We have about four more minutes. So if I could just get your closing remarks, any remarks you'd like to make, things that you know that you wanted to say earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I I'm, uh, really I'm really pleased to be a part of this. I was able to say some things that uh, perhaps have been pent up and, and 
I needed to just kind of get it out. I, I never really mm -hmm. discussed being how I was treated, you know, at the bank or at the Department of Motor Vehicles because I was the first black to work there too. My mother was the first black woman to work at uh, basic magnesium plant in the early 1940s. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you this because she, coming from Fordyce, Arkansas, she didn't have a college degree, mm -hmm. but she had a high school education. My grandfather worked at basic magnesium as a laborer. So he told my mom to come out and get a job. So she came, filled out the application, they hired her. And the next day they said, oh, you get that broom and you start sweeping up here. My mom says, no, 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 no. I have a high school degree. I am not sweeping anywhere. And she says, I will go to the union. And back in the day, they had a very strong union in the 40s. She went to the union and the next day, my mom was standing next to the white ladies making munitions for World War II. So that's something that, that I needed to talk about. And I think we need to talk brings out those types of things. And as more people are brought into this circle, more things will be exposed that we all need to work on. People don't know this stuff. That's like truth and reconciliation. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm glad you were able to tell that story because we need to listen to these stories. And, and so I'll just keep mine short because I know we're running out of time, but just continue these conversations, continue having them and continue with listening, uh, especially um, from those that are living through these experiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining our conversation tonight and for helping us to begin to work, to heal and move forward. We want to thank our panelists, A.B. Wilkinson, Brenda Williams, Kevin Wright, our donors, Sarah Mason and Jerry Tomich, and the UNLV Libraries, Greenspun College Urban Affairs, for sponsoring tonight's program. We want to thank you to the UNLV TV for recording and streaming the panel. So this is amazing. This is a great start. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.